My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Go to Jeremiah, please, the 8th chapter. 8th chapter of Jeremiah. I want you to read with me just one verse and then leave Jeremiah 8th chapter open on your lap because that's where we're going to be the rest of the message. The 7th verse, chapter 8, Jeremiah. The stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. What an indictment. Let's pray. Lord, you are doing something very deep in this church. You're doing something very profound and wonderful. You're digging deep into our hearts. And in 1997, Lord, you're going to purge us as we've never been purged. You're going to search us like we've never been searched. You're going to bring forth revelation and truth that sets us free. And Lord, out of that is going to come a rejoicing such as never been heard before in this house. Times Square Church is going to be jumping with the praises of God. Oh, Lord, you're going to do something marvelous in our midst because you've begun it in our hearts. You've begun it here. You've begun it in all of our hearts. Those of us who deliver the word of the Lord, you've done a work, oh, God, this past year and now you're preparing us. I share what Pastor Carter said, a great anticipation of what you're going to do. But, Lord, first you have to cut. The surgeon comes in and he cuts so there can be healing. Lord, you may have to cut even deeper this afternoon as you did this morning. But, Lord, we thank you for the surgeon's knife. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing. What a, what a marvelous act of grace to deal with us as you do firmly, lovingly, but, oh, God, without compromise. Lord Jesus, I want to hear when I come to this church, I want to hear an uncompromising message. I want that which would would expose anything hidden in my life. I want the mirror held in front of my face. Oh, Spirit of God, come down now. I take your authority, Father, over every principality and power of darkness. Nothing, nothing, nothing shall hinder the word of the Lord. Lord, sanctify our ears. Sanctify my voice and let every ear hear the word of the living God. We glorify you. And we chase every demon out of this house. Every devil out of hell must go in Jesus' name. That the word of the Lord have free course. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the first eight chapters of Jeremiah, the Lord uh, poses some incredible questions, powerful questions. And he's listing, God is listing his concerns for his own people. He's not talking about the heathen. He's not talking about the enemies of Israel. He's talking about God's own chosen people. And, and some of the questions God asked of Jeremiah, like this, he said, why is there such a tendency to backsliding among my people? He says, why do they cling so stubbornly to their secret sins? Why do they continue in their deception? And why do they have a tendency to go back to their old sins? And then he goes on in the first eight chapters, why are my people not really repenting of their sins? Because there was a false repentance. He said, why do they not blush when they sin so openly? He said, my people don't know how to blush anymore. He said, why don't they even say, what have we done? He said, they sin and they don't even ask the question, what have we done? There's no regret. They sin without remorse. They sin without guilt. Why are my people not letting go of their sins? Why are they not wanting full deliverance from the bondage of the sin? He said, why aren't they coming to me for freedom? Why are they not blessing for their sins? Now, folks, he's talking about, God is talking about his own dear, beloved children. He's not talking about heathen. Now, think about that as we go on in the message today. You'll find these God-spoken questions, especially in the 8th chapter of Jeremiah. Because you see, in Jeremiah's time, the people were coming to the Lord weeping. They came searching the Scriptures. They, they, they were probing into the Word of God. But even though they studied the law and claimed they wanted to walk by the law, 
They refused to forsake their idolatry. They wanted their idols. They wanted the sins of their flesh. And they wanted to serve God at the same time. It was a mixture of worship of idols and a worship of Jehovah. And that sickened the heart of God. God says in the, look at verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem? You know, Jerusalem is his own beloved city. And these are his own beloved people. When then is this people of Jerusalem, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast the seat. They refuse to return. He says, why are they holding on to their sins? Folks, look at me, please. This is the question I believe God is asking this church and every church in these last days. If we really believe Jesus is coming, then we stop playing games. If we believe that Jesus is coming and he's right at the door and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, then we go into this word and we tremble at what we read and we do everything within our God-given powers and under the conviction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to deal with our lives. And again, I hear the Holy Spirit saying in our day to me, to you, to all of us, why do you still hold on to the deceit that's in your heart? Why don't you return to me and why don't you let it go? Why aren't you coming to, for full deliverance? Why this double standard, this mixture in your heart that you would come and serve me and worship me and praise me and love me and go into my word, inquiring of my word, and then at the same time holding fast to the deceit that is in your own heart? He said, why are my people holding fast? They won't let go of the deceit that is in their heart. It's amazing because God said, I said, holy prophets. He, he said, it's not because you haven't heard the word. They rose up early. I sent them early in the morning to late at night. They walked the streets. They, they wooed you by the spirit. They warned you by the spirit. And yet, in spite of all of that, you hold on to your deceit. Folks, if you have deceit in your heart of this church, it's not because, if you've been sitting in this church hearing the gospel preached from this pulpit, it's not because you haven't been warned. It isn't because you haven't heard the truth. But he says, why do you still hold on to that thing? Why do you still hold on to that one thing that I've been dealing with? Why won't you let it go? In this case, it was blatant idolatry. The people rejected the call of the prophets. They hardened their hearts. They clamored for a message that was soothing. They said, preach us easy words, soothing words. Oh, beloved, I can name you churches in this city right now while I'm standing here. Uh, maybe not at this particular hour, but every Sunday morning you can go to some of the famous churches in this city and you will not hear one single word that would upset you. It will not raise a hair on your head. It will not raise a conviction in your soul. It will soothe you. You could live in any kind of sin and go in there and feel good about it and walk out feeling even better. Because the man who stands in the pulpit, I tell you right now, is a false prophet. If he will not preach against sin, if he will not show people their iniquities, if he will not deal with the deceit of the heart, he's a false prophet. He has nothing to say. And the only people who go to those kind of churches are those who don't want their sins dealt with. And if they go to a church where the gospel is truly being preached, they walk out and say, that's legalism. And they get angry. Beloved, I see a spirit that's in the church today. The condition described in Jeremiah 8 is a condition today. God's people saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost, still holding fast to deceit, under great delusion, hoping to serve the Lord and still serve their secret sins. Let me make this very personal. We're not talking now about the children of Israel in Jerusalem in Jeremiah's time. We're not talking about those of the Old Testament, not even the New Testament. We're talking about 1996, the last Sunday of 1996. We're talking Times Square Church, David Wilkerson, and this congregation, and all who hear me. Are you sitting here in the presence of God now? The Holy Spirit was moving here mightily in a beautiful way. He came down now just to, to honor 
Christ, Holy Spirit, is always here to honor Jesus. And he's honored Jesus in our midst, and the glory of the Lord was here. Did you sit through all of this? Did you praise the Lord? Did you have your hands up? Did you worship Him today with sin clinging to your heart? Something He dealt with time and time again and you still will not lay it down? You still cling? You still hold fast to the deceit that God by His Spirit is dealing with? That's what God is asking Jeremiah. How can my people come in my presence and worship me and seek my word and still hold fast to their deceit? How can it be that so many Christians today can worship the Lord and, and continue, I mean, month after month and even year after year and not deal? Through their sin. In Jeremiah 8, 5, he says, Why do my people fast the deceit? Why do they not repent and return to holiness? Why did they... In fact, the description is given by God to the prophet Jeremiah. Why do they race off after their sins like horses going to battle? Those horses would, would go against those stays and absolutely puncture themselves. They were rushing into the battle, the sound of battle. There was something in their blood rushing into their sin, rushing into the battle. And folks, he said, that's what my people are doing. They're like wild horses running into the battle, holding fast to the sea, running to destruction, destroying themselves. In verse 7, God answers his own question. And he said, why do, why do my people hold fast to the deceit? And he answers it. It is because my people know not my judgments. And God is saying, I warned them that I would judge their sins. I would pour up my wrath upon those who refuse to forsake their wicked ways. I sent a message after message. I have been patient. We have, we have Christians who believe God can't, there's no end to God's patience. Folks, you, you would know your Bible if you believed that. You would not know your Bible. There comes a time when God says, you have hardened your heart. Nothing I say, nothing I do, nothing I could do, even as God of the universe, will change you. And God talks of giving people over to their sin to reprobate minds. Folks, we are going to have to deal with the reality of the Scripture in these last days. The truth alone that can set us free. Somebody can come to you and talk to you about your sin, but until you allow the Holy Ghost to take this word and cause you to tremble at it, you will never be delivered from your sin. Especially now, if you have cozied up to it, become your bosom sin, and you're comfortable with it now. God had warned severe judgment upon those who flaunted his mercy, and he said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. That was the end of his patience. He said, I will overturn. I, I will deal with this. This people were, uh, judgment was already coming because uh, the Assyrian army had already approached to the, the north border, border in Dan. And they, they said, we can hear the neighing of their horses. These are the Israelites talking who had idolatry in their heart and the stumbling blocks of iniquity in them. And they, they, they were running, fleeing to their cities for the walled cities. And what they were saying, we will run to the cities and we will sit in silence and wait to see what God will do. And what they're saying, we'll go into these walled cities and we will sit and ride out the judgment. God had warned them by the prophets. He said, your sin will find you out. He said, there's judgment on sin. I've been patient. I've wooed you. You're my children. I'm your father. I love you. But you will not heed. You will not listen. He said, there comes a time I have to deal, I have to judge. And God was judging, the Assyrian armies were coming, those prancing horses, they were killing wives and babies and children, everything in sight was being wiped out, and the word came all through Judah and Israel, and they were fleeing to the cities, and they were saying, let us enter into the defense cities and let us sit silent. God has given us water of gall to drink, because we've sinned against the Lord. And folks, they didn't know the judgment of God. They didn't have the slightest idea what was coming. Their concept was we will run into these walled cities and 
There will be a time of trouble. There may not be enough food to eat. There may be a time of no drink. We may be a little thirsty. We may have a time of trial, but we will ride out the storm. And there are people now, I mentioned speaking to a pastor who was involved in outright slander and gossip. And I approached him about it. And I said, do you know your Bible? Do you not understand that God can cut you off? That all through the book of Proverbs, he said, I will chew you to pieces. I will deal with you. I said, do you understand that the judgment of God is on slander, whether you're a preacher or anybody else? And he turned and waved it off and he said, all right, then I face the judgment of God. And I, I, I walked away thinking, oh, if you knew what, if you only knew the judgment of God, you couldn't say that. You couldn't say that. He didn't know anything about the judgment of God. He had no concept of the judgment of God. You can't sit silent and ride out the judgments of God upon your sin. You can't say, all right, and this is what they were saying. We have sinned against God. We have failed God. We, we have been disobedient. We've held to our secret sins. And now we're going to face a time of judgment. But we'll come out of it on the other side. They're going to hold their sins right through the judgment. And how wrong they were. Because they didn't survive the judgments of God. And there are people, Christians, who honestly believe, you know, God's merciful. He, he will... I, 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 they have no plans to lay down their sin. They have no plan to yield to the Holy Spirit. And you know, folks, all that God is asking of you is that you surrender. That's all it is. Just surrender. He's there with open arms. He's there with power. Everything you need. He's there to help you hate your sin. He's there as a loving Father, just hovering over you, waiting for your heart to reach out to Him. Just wanting you to cry, I hate my sin, Father. Come and deliver me from my sin. And He reaches down and pulls you out. But when you become stubborn, you become hardened in your sin, you become blinded to the evil of your sin, you no longer see the deceitfulness of sin. And so you, you say, all right, so I've... So judgment. What is he going to do? Is he going to, you know, all right, I might lose my job. What, what, how bad can it be? Folks, I wouldn't want to wait around for an answer to that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I, I was thinking of a Christian man that I counseled with about a troubled marriage and he's another one of those who had left his wife because he said she's like a witch she's mean she's arrogant and I warned him that God hated divorce because I knew that's where he's headed and I said you're going to lose the blessing in favor of God I said, you're going to have God turn against you because he hates it. And, and you're, you're blatantly walking against his law. And you know what he said? I guess I'll just have to face the consequences of my action. I guess I'll just have to face the consequences. Face the consequences of the judgment of God? That man didn't know the judgments of God. My people don't know the judgment of the Lord. Like Israel, God had given his people... Many warnings about the judgment against sin in believers. Many, many warnings, but they turned those warnings aside. You know, in Romans, the second chapter, we have a very, very clear warning from God. He said, if you do the same things that you condemn in others, if you sin just like those that you condemn, your judgment is sure. He said, you that preach, you shouldn't steal. Do you steal? He said, you, you that condemn adultery in others, are you committing adultery? Do you sit here this afternoon in the middle of an affair, a secret affair nobody knows anything about but God and you? But sir, I'm going to tell you something else. You think your wife doesn't know, she knows and she'll find out. 
Because God said, be sure. What? His sin will, what? Who said that? So count your moments. Take your pleasure now because it's all going to be exposed, the Bible says. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now that's God's word. And that's a word of mercy. God puts these signs up, these warning signs. Because you see, right down that road, there's a precipice and it goes right over a brink. And God has all these signs saying, stop, danger, danger. Be sure your sin will find out. That's a dangerous sign. So God is trying to stop you from going over the brink. It's all mercy. How many believe that? And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and you do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Would you go to Romans 2? Let's look at it. Romans 2. Still with me? Because I hear somebody say, Brother Wilson, you're getting hard. No, no, no. I'm preaching mercy to you. <laughs> Romans 2. Would you go to verse 21? Well, let's start at verse 19. You're confident that thou, that thou thyself are died of the blind, a light to them which are in darkness, instruct of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it, it is written. Look at me, please. He, he's speaking to Christians. He said, you're blaspheming the name of Jesus when you practice something you're preaching against. When you tell others... And folks, some of us, we allow things in our lives that we wouldn't excuse in anybody else's life. We, we allow things in life that we would condemn in others. And the Lord said, that's blasphemy among the unsaved. That is something God says, I will not endure. He said, you treasure up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul said, there is no respect of persons with God. For the Lord shall judge the secrets of men heart, men's hearts by Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you something. I'm 65 now, going on 66. And I've been preaching for many, many years since just a boy. And I've looked back over my life, and I thank God for the grace, His keeping power, how He's kept me by His grace. Many times he could have cast me aside and destroyed me. But the grace of God came. But let me tell you, I said, oh God, how is it? How is it that you have kept me these years? And there's one verse, there is absolutely one verse that has been one of my key verses all my life, all my ministry. And it's this. I just want you to listen to it. It's Proverbs 16:6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord. Folks, the church of Jesus Christ has lost the fear of God. We've made God to appear like a man like ourselves, just like us. And we judge our sins as though God were somebody just like us that would appease us. That if we would cry and say, I'm so sorry, we'd go sin again, cry and repent, sin again, cry and repent, sin again. You say, after all, he said, we're to forgive 70 times 7. Well, I, I, I've got this habit, I've got this secret sin in my life, and I, I, I may have confessed it maybe 200 times, but I've got 200 sometimes more to go. It's not what that scripture means whatsoever. God said, I am no respecter of persons. 
And here's the point, and listen closely. There are many people who hold on to their secret sins because they feel that they're special. They feel that somehow because uh, they, they, they don't hurt anybody, I've often, I've often wondered, I, I was at a church once where there was a janitor that was not a Christian and he would sit, he probably sat for 20 years hearing the gospel, hearing all the speakers and everything and never moved by God. And I thought, how do, how does a man like that hear preaching after preaching and nothing moves him? And he, and he sits back in the back of the church and just sits there unmoved. He's a janitor, he takes care of the church, and he's there watching, he's hearing, and, and after a while goes in one ear and out the other, doesn't mean anything, it's just words to him anymore. You know, because that man actually was thinking to himself, like so many, really, those drug addicts that come to this church, I'm not like them. These alcoholics and all these people get up and say that they're saved and say, I'm not that, I'm a pretty good person. And, and I, I feel in my heart that when I get before God, I'll be okay. The Lord's not going to judge me. And you see, they know nothing of the judgment of God. They know nothing that they must stand before the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that to judgment. And that is final, that is sure. But we have people that, that have absolutely, almost the whole city out here. You can take people that have not murdered anybody, people that faithfully pay their income tax. Oh, they've got their little secret things, yes. But because there's no big, blatant sin, I'm okay. And that's why they write books like, I'm okay, you're okay. But I believe what Apostle Peter said, for the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall it be? of them that obey not the gospel of God. Now, folks, this judgment of God, let me talk to you about it for just a moment. We know so little about the fear of God today. We know so little about the judgment of God. The Bible says it's by the fear of God that we, we run from evil, that we flee from evil, from our idols. The fear of God, and you can't incubate that. You can't invent it. You can't just make it arise in your heart. That comes through sincere crying and praying out to God. The Holy Ghost has to fire that flame in you. My prayer every day is, oh God, I want your fear to blaze in me. When I stand in the pulpit, I want to, I want the fear of God blazing in me. When I go through, get up in the morning, let the fear of God be a blaze in my heart. That when the enemy comes at me with temptation and all these other things, the fear of God will be burning bright and be consumed in that fire and that blaze. Hallelujah. How many want the fear of God? The holy, righteous fear of God. You could never sin lightly. But you see, the, the judgments prophesied against God's people in Jerusalem were not eternal judgment. This was not judgments that would come to them when they die. These were judgments that come to us while they're here on earth. And these are the judgments of God. Folks, it's not just judgment on judgment day. Sin that was not confessed and forsaken, sin that is not laid down, those secret things that cling to us and grow and take root and get harder and deeper into our spirits, that's what God is after. And you know, sometimes people will ask God to pluck up one sin and one idol is knocked down and another is raised up right in its place. And God wants to take out all idolatry. He wants to take away all stumbling blocks. Hallelujah. Not knocking one down and let another coming up in its place. But you see, these judgments of God that God's people don't know anything about, he begins to explain those judgments. I'm going to give you just two evidences of those judgments, two consequences of those judgments listed in this eighth chapter. First of all, verse 10. Would you look at verse 10, please? Therefore will I give... No, first of all, it says, My people know not the judgment of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others. I will give their wives unto others. Now look at me, please. This is the judgment of, of sin, especially in the, the life of a married person. If you're married, listen to me closely. 
God says, I'll give your wives to others. This is blatant divorce. This is pandemic divorce. This is the breaking up of homes. This is the dysfunctional family, and we see it everywhere we go. Folks, the judgment of God is on America, and it's happening in the church. Did, did you get the latest news? I saw this in a, in a Christian magazine, that there are as many evangelical Christians divorcing as those that are not going to church. Just as much divorce in evangelical churches as in the world. Dysfunctional families. This is the judgment of God. He said, if you hold on to your sin, you're married and you have sin, you have lust in your heart, and you will not lay it down and you follow your idolatry, it's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your family. It's going to cost your children. I have seen grandparents whose children have been raised, and those two never did settle things with God. They never did have it right with God. And then when the children were gone, the children were the only thing holding it together when the children are married. God, grandma, grandpa get divorced. And you know what I've seen? Especially with ministers, grandparent ministers of the gospel. You know what I've seen over and over again? I've seen that divorce spread all through their married kids. One after another, following the example of their parents. And he said, I'll give your wives to another. The judgment of God is a dysfunctional family, a loss of children. In Malachi chapter 2, God said, You cover the altar of the Lord with your tears and with weeping and with crying out, yet you are untrue to your wives. Yet she's your companion, the wife of your covenant. You've wearied the Lord with your words. You think God still delights in them that do evil. You think God still delights in you, even though he sees what is in your heart. I, w I wonder how many wives there are listening to me now. Folks, I'm at the place now. I've told God I have to make every year count. I have to make every message count, every day count. And I, I have been faithful as I know how to be. I've, I've made mistakes, yes, I know. In, 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 in the past years, I've made mistakes. I'm not a perfect man. I want to talk to you plain and simple. It may sound blunt to you. But how many wives are sitting here right now wanting out of their marriage? How many husbands are wanting out? You're thinking of divorce. You're thinking of splitting. You're thinking of going your own way. He's, God said, you come to my house and you cover the altar with tears. And yet you're unfaithful in your heart. He's talking about what's going on in the heart. You're unfaithful in your heart. You're treachery, you have treachery in your heart. God says, I'll judge that. I will judge that. God, let it not be in this church. Let it be that every wife that's here thinking she's in an impossible situation believe that nothing is impossible with God. Let every husband that's hearing me right now not even anticipate or think about it because God hates divorce. That is not an option for a believer. It's not an option. It can't even enter your thoughts. It will cost you your home, it will cost you your children, it will cost you everything. And that's the second judgment. Verse 10, and I'll give your fields to them that shall inherit them. In the original Hebrew it says, I'll give your fields to others. Your field is, your, is the area, that, that, that whole substance of what you spent your whole life building. For me, my field is this congregation, it's the church. Pastor Carter, this is his field, New York, it's a ministry here. And God says, if you will not yield, if you will not lay down your sin, if you're going to hold to your deceit, I'll give your field to somebody else. And oh, I've seen that over and over. I've seen missionaries come home from the field. I'm dealing with a couple right now. A man overseas fell in love, he said, with somebody overseas. And his wife came home and she's in despair. 
and he's going to fly over and get her and bring her back and marry her, and it's a mess. But I've seen what happens now. That he doesn't have a dollar to his name. His ministry's been taken from him. Nobody on that field wants him. He wants to go back to that field. Nobody wants to touch him. Nobody wants near him. God said, I'll take your field away from you, and I'll give it to somebody else. I'll take away all everything you have. Folks, that's what sin does. Sin will take everything you have. You want a divorce, sir? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you alimony. It's going to cost you heartache. It's going to cost you probably your car. I had a woman recently tell me that, that her husband had divorced her about 10 years ago. She said, Brother Dave, he divorced me and had every right to because I shamed him. I was not faithful. I, 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 he had every right. I sinned against my husband. And she said, I had a beautiful home, I had beautiful furniture, very expensive, everything. I lived in style. I wound up sleeping in my car. Thank God she got a hold of God and the Lord began to bless her and prosper her. She's serving the Lord now faithfully, being mightily blessed of God. But God took her fields. He'll take your fields. He'll give your best to somebody else. Uh-huh. The wages of sin. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You say, brother, why are you talking about adultery, fornication? Because the Holy Ghost told me to deal with it. Because God's trying to save some people from hell. God's coming right to your face, face to face. Because you sit here, nobody else knows about it but you and God. Supposedly. If you're in the office, everybody knows it anyhow. They're talking behind your back. Mm hmm. And, and, and God has come face to face with you from a pastor who cares about your soul. And the Holy Ghost says, I'm speaking directly to it now that you've been convicted of it by the power of the Holy Ghost and you lay it down and get your freedom back and get the joy of the Lord back and get the blessing of the Lord flowing and all your rivers flowing once again that have been held up by your sin hallelujah don't anybody look around look in now I'm not suggesting we have many, many into this. If I'm speaking to one or two, it's worth. It's worth every word. It's worth the time to stop and talk it about. I will give your fields to them that shall inherit it. Another present judgment is an invasion of serpents and snakes. Verse 17, Behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices, among you which shall not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Folks, this is God's word. This is not a pastor getting up, venting his spirit. This is God's word. God said, persist in your sin. I've loved you, I've been patient with you, but he said, it comes a time I'm warning you. Go on with it. And I'll tell you, I, I'm, you're, you're going to split your home. You're going to split everything. You're going to lose everything. I'll give your fields and your career and your business. I'm going to give everything to somebody else. And then I'm going to send serpents to bite you. And you're going to live out your days with poison in you. Bitterness. Rejection. Guilt. Shame. These serpents will bite you. God says... I will send these serpents. Verse 17, behold, read it with me. Verse 17, chapter 8. For behold, I, I, who is it? I will send serpents 
cockatrices are those, uh, what, what cockatrices are, are the little snakes that are the most poisonous. Among you which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now what happens when you're bitten with the serpent? The poison goes all through your system. And folks, I see Christians everywhere I look now, full of poison, bitter, angry, full of rebellion. Why? Because of sin that is unsurrendered. Unsurrendered, and folks, it produces nothing but the cockatrice bite. Show me a Christian who's living with a hidden secret lust or living a double life. He refuses conviction, refuses the warnings of God's word. That Christian is going to become hard in his sin and his very character is going to change. I see people changing. Folks, probably the saddest thing that can happen in the church of Jesus Christ is that those who should be mothers in Zion, fathers in Zion, those with gray hairs who should be sweet and mellow, be a testimony to a dying world and young people looking for examples of God's grace and mercy to see them become mean and angry and bitter. Nothing, nothing is more vile in my eyes. Nothing bothers me more than to see a grandma in her 70s or 80s sucking a cigar, drinking a cocktail and cursing like a, a drunken sailor. Nothing worse than in the house of God to see grandmothers and women above 50 and 60 years of age in the house of God growing every day and every week meaner and angrier, their face creased with bitterness. And they still come to the house of God, but the serpent has bitten them because sin, unforgiveness, bitterness. And you look at them, so, Lord, their last day spent full of poison. Oh, Lord, I don't want that in my, oh, God, I don't want any poison in me. Hallelujah. I don't want any poison in my system. I want to grow sweeter as the days go by. Hallelujah. what happened to Saul, didn't it? He had bitterness and jealousy and hatred in his heart. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon him. That man died face to face with a witch full of anger, bitterness, and rebellion. And, and, and folks, it's the, the thing that robbed these people was that they knew not the judgment of the Lord. And, with, and I'm going to close with this, but this is so important. Verse 8, please. Verse 8. I'm going to come to the close now. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Though certainly in vain made he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. And in the original Hebrew, the pen of the scribes is a lying pen. What the, what the scribes and the priests and the prophets are preaching now, Jeremiah, God is telling Jeremiah, they're not preaching the truth. They're saying, we are wise. Look, it says, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us. The, the, here, look at this picture, please. Jerusalem is bound by idolatry. The judgment of God is at the door. People know nothing of the judgment of God. And they're in their midst. They are being charmed by a false gospel. And you know, these scribes said, we know the law. They bisected the law. They said, we are wise in the law. We know what the law means. But you know what they did? They perverted the law. They took away the power and the sting of the law. Folks, we are not under the law as a way of salvation, but we are under the law as a moral code. God has not done away with the law. He has honored the law by his absolute perfect righteousness. He has exalted the law as a moral standard. That is our standard. Tell me which one of the Ten Commandments you're not to obey anymore. Give me one. Commandment of God of the Ten that you're not supposed, you and I are not supposed to obey anymore. We are not saved by the law, but it's still our moral code. 
But you see, they've taken away the law. They took away the law and they were saying, peace, peace. We have the law on our side and they were telling people were evil and corrupted that you are a righteous person. You are righteous people. Beloved, let me tell you something. There was a time I was probably one of the hardest preachers in America. I've told Pastor Carter sometimes I listened to my tapes from 20 years ago and I have to shut it off. I, I said, I can't handle that. Because you see, the Lord had to add mercy and grace. And he, he, he seasoned it with mercy and grace. And I've preached a lot of mercy. You've heard Pastor Carter preach great mercy and love. We have preached mercy. We've talked to you about a heavenly father who loves us, who's a nurse to us. We've talked to you about being justified and sanctified by faith. We've talked to you about how, how Jesus Christ is the only righteousness. We have no other plea but his righteousness. Because you see, even when you lay your idols down, even when you can say there's nothing between me and the Lord, it's still not your goodness. It's the mercy and the grace of God and nothing else. But folks, that's one side of this coin. There's another side to the coin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There, there are so many scriptures here. They said the law of the Lord is with us. And we hear some people preaching what they believe is the truth. But it's all mercy. It's all love. It's all grace. It's all, uh, don't worry. You're okay. Listen to what the word says. Listen closely now. Lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. Lay it aside. Now, folks, that's not the law. That's grace. You've got a sin in your life. Lay it aside. Deal with it. Listen to what the Scripture says. Cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And God means that. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's not law. That's not legal. That is mercy. That is grace. He says, but fornication, all uncleanness, all covetousness, let it not once be named among you. And then he says, come out from among them, be you separate and clean, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then I receive you as my, as a father. You'll be my son. You'll be my daughter. Then I receive you. That's the word too. Now, I tell you always, we close with hope. Now, I want you to go with me, if you will, please, to Psalm 103. Will you stand as we read it? Psalm 103. Did you hear what I said this morning? The judgments of God are not vindictive, they're redemptive. He judges us to save us. Paul said, I turned him over to the devil, to the destruction of the flesh, that his soul might be saved. Judgment to redeem. Hallelujah. Do you have Psalm 103? All right, let's, let's begin reading verse 10 from King James I'm reading. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. The wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall be no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon whom? Upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. To who? To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Folks, what is his commandment? Confess and forsake your sin. Touch not the unclean thing. I say this the last thing I want to say to you this afternoon. I know some of you are battling uh, a horrible battle. You say, Pastor David, I'm convicted. 
I'm deeply convicted. I know what it says here. The mercy of God is upon them that fear him and those who keep his commandments and remember to do them. But I don't have the power. I keep falling. Here, here's the issue. Listen close. Here's the issue. Don't make peace with that sin. Don't say, I'm going to live with it. So, oh God, put it in my heart to hate it. Help me to keep battling. God has never once ever turned away his heart from somebody. No matter how deep in sin they are, no time in history has God ever turned his back or cast away a Christian or a sinner who hates his sin. He has never turned away from those who cry out for deliverance. You may not have it yet, but you're crying out for deliverance. God sees that. He will come. He will bring deliverance. Because that's what your heart yearns and cries for. Don't lose that cry. He's not going to fail you. He's going to deliver you. Now, folks, I've, I've, I've preached along this line this morning, again this afternoon. But God's trying to lead this church into the greatest uh, arena of worship and praise that you and I have ever witnessed. The glory of the Lord wants to come down in this church as he's doing it in many churches today. But he can't do that until we come to him with clean hands and a pure heart and nothing, absolutely nothing hidden in our lives. That you come to church and you raise your hands and you know that you're clean. You know that you have come and laid your sin at the foot of the cross and said, Jesus, here it is. I don't want it. I give it to you. I surrender it to you. Now you give me the grace. You give me the power. You keep, you keep me hating this sin. He's going to rush in. Now I'll tell you, nobody going to have to pump up anything. The choir's not going to have to pump you up. The orchestra, no song leader have to pump you up. Folks, you'll come to this church and you'll be running. I mean, you will come with your hands up and you'll be running in mercy and grace. And there'll be a conviction. There'll be a conviction upon everybody that comes in just because of the awesome presence of the Lord. And you talk about joy. Nobody has joy like people who've been set free. Nobody. You guys from Timothy House and the girls over here from Sarah House and everybody else been delivered from sin and the power of sin. You may be struggling about it, but I'll tell you right now, so oh God, I mean it when I tell you I want to hate this. I don't want to go back. Keep me, Lord, from falling. Present me faultless before your throne with exceeding great joy. And when you follow that and pray every day and get into this word, you won't be standing there anymore. You'll be jumping all over the place with joy and victory like you've never known. Hallelujah. I understand some of you have been doing that up there anyhow. Amen. Yes. Holy Spirit. Mm. Bring the hammer down on us. We thank you, Lord, that that hammer is held by a velvet glove of love. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for everyone in this building that's been battling a besetting sin that has been holding them back from the fullness of God. It's been such a burden. It's robbed them of such freedom. God, let there be total, final victory in this house today. Nobody needs to know what it is. You just get out of your seat up in the balcony here in the main floor. Hey, there's victory. There's victory today, right now. There's victory within the next 10 minutes. Yes, there is. Get out of your seat. Just get out of your seat. Bring it to God. If you're backslidden, if you don't know Jesus, or if you've got this, this thing that you're battling, bring it to the Lord right now. The Bible says open confession. Open confession. Open confession. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City.
You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I have a prophetic word this morning. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Lord has entrusted me to bring a prophetic message, but this is very strong in my heart. I want you to turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, my message, in one hour, everything's going to change. In one hour. 24th chapter of Isaiah. I'm going to read just the first few verses. And then you leave your Bible open because I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's the prophecy is all here. It's not my prophecy. It's, uh, it's the Lord's prophecy given through Isaiah, his holy prophet. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, and with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, the seller, as with the lender, the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury. Land shall be emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. Father, in love and brokenness, I come to this congregation with something that you placed on my heart, something prophesied many, many years ago, aimed at this very generation and this time. Lord, I pray that you awaken our hearts that, that we would not tremble, we would not fear, but we would trust your word to bring strength to us. Now, Lord, come upon me by your Holy Spirit. Let me speak the word of the living God with confidence and faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, through the prophet Isaiah said, a time is coming. God said, I'm going to turn everything upside down. And the scripture makes it very clear. It says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. There's a sudden judgment coming to this world. And it's at the door. And I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's not my message. Now, if you're tied to this world, if you're in love with the things of this world and you are not walking with the Lord, you're not wanting to hear, you will not want to hear this and you may want to just cast it aside and say, well, I'll endure this message. It, 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 and even if you are a born-again Christian, if you love the Lord and you're close to him, if you didn't believe that this is the pure word of God, there may be a tendency not to take it serious. But this is the word of God. It is not man's prophecy. There are a lot of prophecies going forth in the world, and, and they are, uh, I don't know whether you would call them scripturally based or not, but this is scripture. This is the living word of God. And if you believe this is the pure word of God, then you have to open your heart to what the prophet Isaiah has to say this morning. In one hour, the world is going to change, the scripture says. In fact, when you get to Revelation 8th chapter, John warned in one day, death and mourning, yea, in one hour, an utter burning and judgment will come. That's the 18th chapter of Revelation. And it confirms that this is going to happen. Jesus said it's going to be when all men cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. A sudden, unexpected destruction comes from the hand of the Lord. Isaiah warns that there, he mentions a city. In fact, a number of prophets do, but most uh, eminent Bible scholars, and I've checked through my library, and they believe, as I do, that this prophecy that we're hearing this morning from Isaiah is, at, is, is directed to this generation. 
In just a moment, I'll enlarge on that and tell you why I believe we can pinpoint it into our very generation, our time. In one day, in one hour, and it says at that time, there, there was going to be a great burning. Now, secular prophets and those in homeland security, whether it's in the United States or England or Germany, all over the world now, they, they are saying that, that there is going to come a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust coming to a city. They often name New York City. You, you know what's happened here. We lived through the 9-11 experience. And you could look out of the apartment, especially where we are, and you could see the burning, you could see the fire and the smoke ascending to heaven. And a few weeks ago, remember the eruption of the steam pipe and uh, the earth opened up and swallowed a truck and you saw pictures of people running everywhere and they're screaming, is this it, is this it? They're thinking nuclear. And the scripture says, when you go through Isaiah, the 24th chapter, it, it says that the gates are going to be dissolved. The gates are going to be uh, devastated. That means the exits and entrances. We don't know where it is. The city is named and a burning and a fire is mentioned here. I've been prophesying for a number of years that uh, of something I saw when I was on the street and in on Broadway and 42nd Street, and it's come back to me many, many times of a thousand bur fires burning in this particular city we, in which we live. But you see, I don't know where it is. He doesn't name the city, but he does say that there, there, there is going to be a sudden destruction that's going to change everything. The world is going to change in one hour. The church is going to change in one hour. And we as individuals are going to change in one hour. Now, this message is not to frighten, because if, if you're confident that you're saved and under the blood of Christ and redeemed, you know that anything like this happens, it's instant glory. We pass from life into death. And like the Apostle Paul said, we should be of this mindset, that we thank God for this world. We thank God for our life, but our preference is to go and be with Christ. That should be the desire in your heart. The scripture said the fear of death is a dominion. It's a terror. And Paul said, you've lived all your life that way. But he said, God says he doesn't want you to live that way. He wants to deliver us from the fear of death. And if we lose the fear of death through trusting in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not fear no matter what happens, what the newscast is, what anybody says, or a message such as this. You, you will only be moved to awaken to what the, the Lord says to do. And let, let me not get ahead of myself here. We don't know where this is going to happen. First of all, the hour is going to come when the whole world is going to change. Now, eminent Bible scholars believe that chapter 24 and 25 of Isaiah have to do with our time this very day. A sudden cataclysmic event is going to strike. And the Bible, Isaiah says, the lofty, this is... 26 verse 5, the lofty, meaning the proud city, will be laid low even to the ground. Bible, then, according to the prophet, there is utter chaos. And folks, you can go out in the street here on this Sunday afternoon, go right outside the door on a sunny day, and say, how could it happen that in one hour there could be such confusion where government can't do anything about it. Societal agencies can't do anything about it because even when 9-11 struck this city, they came from all over the world. They poured in from all the United States, firemen, police officers, and helpers, and uh, there was uh, armies of people wanting to help. But folks, this cataclysmic event makes very, is made very clear in the scripture it's going to be beyond human ability to cope with. And, and even now, we, we listen to our secular prophets, and they, they talk about trying to prepare. But there, there is there's coming a day that in one hour, society changes. A whole world changes. The Bible says the merchants will weep and weep and wail and cry because no one is buying their merchandise. They're all sellers and no buyers. This 
past week, the <clears throat> director or the CEO of a large fund put his 142-foot yacht for sale. His 16-bedroom house in Aspen went up for sale because his high-risk funds are fading and he's in deep trouble and it happened overnight. And, and now all of these risk funds, mortgage companies going bankrupt left and right. And, and we are facing an incredible monster economic upheaval. I've been warning about that. I stood in this pulpit a year ago, this Sunday, I think it was, or, or within one or two Sundays, warning about the mortgage market and telling people if you're flipping houses and you don't know how to do that, you're not a real estate agent, get out. We warned about that. And because you say, well, why warn? What's the purpose of that? Why don't you just wait till it happens? Why live on any kind of anxiety? Why put this burden upon us? But remember what Jesus said when he first saw the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, there's going to be a, this city is going to burn to the ground. And he said, I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you'll believe. You'll believe that there is a God who so loved you. He warns you. And, and he, he said, that it, there's going, this, this, this city is going to the ground and there won't be one stone left upon another in the temple. And Jesus warned. He said, now, I'm warning you for a reason. So that when it happens, when you see these things come up, you will understand that you were loved. And, and Paul the Apostle, when he's talking about the sudden destruction, he called that information light. He said, you're members of the body walking in light. You're getting Holy Ghost insight. He said, you're not in the darkness. You won't walk in darkness. So that when these sudden things come, and, and there's panic all around you. There's going to be something happen to you by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be something that quickens you and say, well, my God warned me. There were true, two word, true words that came forth from the pulpit, and we were, we were warned. Even though in this day of prosperity, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But folks, it is here, and I'll tell you why this message is being brought forth this morning before I close. He said the dreams are going to fade. He, he goes on to say that the music is going to fade, of, of the zithers or the guitars, and, and the, the, uh, there's, there's going to be such a change. Everything is going to change in this world in one hour. If, if there were a nuclear attack on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, any city in Israel, I told you about the Samson option. And, and they have such a radar system. They have such protective uh, equipment that as soon as a missile's released toward Israel, within moments, they have about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, according to some experts, and retaliatory missiles would hit and strike and wipe out every enemy of Israel. Folks, I'm going to talk to you in just a, a moment about why I believe that the, the, that the prophet Isaiah is talking about our day. First of all, by the growing number of prophets warning of an apocalyptic moment coming. Now, when I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about just church prophets. I'm talking about secular prophets because God uses secular prophets. These are experts. These are scientists. And remember in the scripture, God said of, of Assyria, Assyria is my rod against Israel to correct them. In other words, Assyria is doing my will. I am speaking through Assyria to my people. And remember also about Cyrus. The scripture said of Cyrus, he's a heathen king. And when you get to Amos, Amos the prophet said, Cyrus is God speaking through him, said, Cyrus is my shepherd and he's doing my bidding. So when, when you hear all of these secular uh, scientists and all of these 
These are not church people. These are not religious people. They're, they are saying it's at the door. Uh, what about the sensuality? What about all of this nonchalance? What about this racing for money and gold and greed? Wall Street has become the greediest source of, of, of vile corruption in man's history. They have taken this nation into such risk and such depth, their debt, there is no way out of it. And we live right at the foot of, we, it, it's right at the, <clears throat> just blocks away from where I'm preaching this morning. And the second reason, you, you see, what I'm preaching this morning is mild compared to what I hear now. Is that right or wrong? What you hear in the news and what you hear constantly fed so that we just want to turn it off. But you see, God moves. God moves in. <clears throat> these, these are the warning times when prophets are speaking because the scripture says the Lord <clears throat> will do nothing until he speaks through his prophets, through Amos. God said, I don't do anything until I warn through my prophets. And the second reason why... I believe we can assume that what Isaiah is warning speaks to our generation. God always moves in judgment. He always acts when the cup of violence overflows. Violence. Now, folks, let me speak plainly to you from the depths of my soul. I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I'm a watchman. Just one of many. But listen to me now. There is no greater violence in the sight of God than the violence of pedophiles. Those who are raping children. Those who are stealing children right off the streets and taking them to, to the Far East and putting them in brothels in India and all the, the Far East. And, and here in the United States, an entire church denomination paying hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because their little children were sodomized. Folks, when you turn to Dafar and you find that hundreds and even thousands of little children were shedded to death. When you think of the thousands and thousands of babies aborted in the United States and around the world, and that blood cries from the ground, and the Bible says God destroyed Noah's age, because the earth was filled with violence. And God said, I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it. I will not take it. And he was patient for 120 years of strong, faithful preaching, a prophetic word. And then God saw. And folks, I believe now, think of the, the murdering in our schools, the the. terrorizing of our children. You can, you can hard. What are we doing? Getting hardened to the news? Does it not move us anymore? I can tell you it moves the heart of God. And I believe that blood cries from the ground. How long do you think God will endure? How long do you think God will put up with, with this? Even here now, on the internet, a pedophile is taking pictures and, and telling pedophiles where to go to find the children where it's easiest to pick up a child. And he's allowed to do it and had, can't be stopped. Folks, that's all going to change. This is all going to change in one hour. Secondly, sudden destruction... <clears throat> When it comes, is going to change the church. In one hour, the church is going to change. It's going to change dead churches. It's going to change live churches. The prophet pictures a great shaking as though God took an olive tree that had already been harvested, and he begins to shake it. In other words, there, there's been a harvest, but there's still, God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. 
I'm, I'm going to turn everything upside down, according to the prophet. In this time of shaking, though, something is going to happen that's so incredible. If you have your Bibles <clears throat> open, I want you to go to verse 14. Now, before you do that, don't get ahead of me, please. Look this way. Now, remember, this is a time of, of cataclysmic devastation. This is a time that's so incredibly dark. This is a time of fire. And in the middle of that, what about God's people? What's happening in the church? The apostasy is going to change overnight. Everything that we see that is wrong in the church of Jesus Christ is going to change. But in the house of God, there's going to be a revival. And I want you to see it, folks. And if you, it, it, this one, I, I saw it and began to pray over it and began to study and do my research on this. See, this is not, I didn't get along with God and pray and say, God, talk to me. Put in my head what's going to happen. I have people all over the world, wherever I travel, say, Brother Dave, you speak of prophetic. What's, what's next? What's coming? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll go to my Bible. If God speaks it through his word, then I believe it and then I'll preach it. So I see this and it makes me shout. I know what's coming and you know what's coming. But folks think God's interest is in his church. In the church of Jesus Christ, his overcoming church. And the Bible said in the middle of this, there's going to be a song rise up. From the islands of the sea, from the uttermost parts of the world, there's going to be a song rise up in the middle of all of this. Look at it, verse 14. Then shall they lift up, first, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there's going to be a great shaking. What's happening during the shaking? Verse 13, verse 14. Then they, in other words, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing, for the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify you the Lord in the fires. Did you hear it? <laughs> there should be an amen coming from the glory of your soul. Because in the middle of the fire, God's going to have a people who are not in panic. God is going to have a people that are going to praise the majesty of Almighty God. He said, in the fires you will sing. There's a song coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're not going down. We're going up. We are going up. There shall be a song in the midst of the fire. <clears throat> Verse 16, for the, from the uttermost part of the earth, have we heard what? Not weeping, not groaning, not murmuring, not complaining. Not agonizing, but you hear a song coming from China, and then you hear it from India. You hear it coming out of the tribes of Africa, out of Darfur, out of every nation. It's coming from every island of the sea. It's coming from the United States and Canada, South America, the whole world, for the uttermost part of the world. I hear a song, the prophet said. I hear a, I hear people who are facing calamity. I hear people that... Uh, Seemingly have no hope, and there's a song. There's a choir. We heard over 150 voices here this morning singing. Can you imagine the great sound that was coming out of the 150? Can you imagine millions and millions of people around the world singing the song when this hour comes? It's coming in the darkest time of all. I, I, I believe that, <clears throat> that something's going to happen among our youth, especially college students. Do you understand that for, for the past 10 years especially, our children, our young people are going into colleges and their faith is being robbed? That ungodly atheistic teachers and professors have our young people as prisoners for three, four, five, and six years. And they keep bombarding them till there's no faith. They, they leave believing there is no God. Till I can sweeten 80% of the people now say the population that there's no God. Don't believe in God. 20% believe in God. 
And many, many students. And folks, I believe that's going to change because in one hour, when everybody is waking and when the world is shaking and trembling, those professors are going to be looking for somebody to give them a word. Prosperity preachers are going to get their Bibles out looking for something to say to the people saying, what's happened? Why didn't you warn us? But I believe that in that time, everything in college is going to change. Oh, yes. All the survivors. You see, this is not, I'm not talking about the end of the world. There's still ahead. There's, the, 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 things are going to change in one hour. But there's still, we're talking about in the future beyond that, the Antichrist. And, but you see, the Antichrist can't come to power until there's chaos. It has to come out of chaos. Hitler came out of chaos. The Antichrist is going to come out of a chaotic world where he, there, there is something of wisdom. There's something given to him, a demonic power that brings people some kind of hope. I'm talking about the secular world. But folks, this is all about to change. Now the Bible says we as individuals are going to change. In one hour, we're going to have our focus in life changed, our entire focus. We will no longer be obsessing about our own problems and adversities. We won't be, we won't be focused on me. We won't be focused on our problems as serious as they are and, and as challenging as they may be. God, it's very clear. This will not be our focus. That's all going to be changed. Everything that was once dear to us. It's, it's no longer going to have value it's, it, other than those things that are of the spirit and of love and of Christ. Things that we held dear are, are going to be held and, and absolutely are going to vanish. By this, meaning the calamity, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged when he turns all the stones into dust. This is Isaiah 27, 9. He said, I'm going to take all the idols. And he said, by this, in other words, this great cataclysmic event is going to bring down all the idols. All the idols are going to be crushed to stone, is what the Bible says. Here's the promise from the book of Isaiah, 27th chapter. He said, in that day, all the idols will be trampled to dust. They're not going to, the last thing the world's going to be talking about is sports. I have nothing in sports. I like sports. I'm a football fan. But, you know, the Bible says it's going to be good. They're not going to be any more $250 million settlement for these people in a starving world. He said it's all going to change. It goes even deeper than that. Let me find it here in the Scripture. It shall be... Here's where we're going to be in a level field. Listen to this very please. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, or the buyer and the seller, as with the lender and the buyer. Everything will be brought to a same level, whether it's presidents, world leaders, those in poverty, all going to face the same struggles, the same conditions. <clears throat> Nothing will There'll be no respect of persons. Are you ready for some comfort? <laughs> I said, are you ready for some comfort? Yes. Folks, I don't like to preach like this. For the last six weeks, I've preached nothing but grace. I risk people getting mad. Every time I've had to preach much like this, people leave. But one day I stand before God. And he said, if you see these things coming and you don't warn, the blood's on your hand. And I read that and tremble. There should be no one that comes to Times Square Church surprised. Should, 
You don't sit around waiting for things to happen. But let me tell you what Paul the Apostle said. I want you to follow this very closely before I close. Paul said, he has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, whether we, we, we will live together with him. He said, comfort yourself. He, he's talking about sudden destruction. He's talking about time that we're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I want you to comfort one another. Comfort one another. And he said, whether we live or die. And folks, that's where we have to come to right now. You, you, you watch the news in the next 30 days, and especially the next two weeks. Listen to, to what's happening to the economy. Listen and just remember God speaking, not to make you afraid, but to prepare your heart. He said, you're to put on the breastplate of faith. This is Paul the Apostle said, in these times when we live under the threat of a sudden destruction or the knowledge of a sudden destruction coming on the earth, when, when, when this has been told to us and when we see it and we hear it, he, he said, you're not to tremble, you're not to sorrow as the world sorrows. He said, no. He, he said, you go about comforting one another and speak to one another, saying, live or die, we're the Lord's. Now, it comes down to this, co- going to your friends, going to the body of Christ, went after them and shake hands and look right in the eye and say, live or die, we're the Lord's. That's what Paul said. You're going to encourage one another and say, we live or die, we will go and live with Christ. We are headed for eternal life in Christ. Folks, I'm asking God, and I, I more and more, you say, well, you can come to that because you're old man now. But you see, I'm coming to a place now where I'm not going to live in fear. I don't live in fear. I want to be here in the United States. I want to be here in New York City if anything happens to this city. I want to be here in the middle of it. And I don't want the fear of death to have dominion over me. And you can't have freedom. You can't have freedom until you comfort yourself with the word of God, saying, I will, whatever happens, if it happens tomorrow, bless God, I'm going to be shouting on the streets of glory with all the saints of God. I'm going to pass from death into life. This, we're not to live in fear. We're not to live in bondage. You say, well, Brother Dave, you already put us in fear, and now you're trying to get us out of it. No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. I, I, my message today is that there's a song coming out of this. And if you leave this building, if you leave this building discouraged, if you walk out of here and say that's nothing but gloom and doom, yes, it is on a human level. But on a spiritual level, it's life eternal. It's life And I just have a secret thought in my heart. It's probably just David Wilkerson's thoughts. But I have a feeling, just as before 9-11, the Holy Spirit moved in this church and other congregations and warned us there were moments of silence. Sometime 15 minutes we sat in this church just before the blast. And God was speaking to us not to be afraid. And I, it's going to be different this time. I believe that... If something is going to happen in this city or wherever it happens, the saints of God are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. And there's going to be some singing and shouting and praising of God to encourage the body to strengthen their spirit. Now get up on your feet. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Folks, I've got the Holy Ghost all over me right now. I have the Holy Spirit upon my soul. He wants to come upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken you. Take the fear out of your heart. You young people that are in the choir, the young people that are listening to me right now, there is a future. The whole world thinks there's no future. Folks, this is just the beginning of our future. This is just the beginning of our future. Hallelujah. I feel good.
There are going to be a lot of people listening to this tape, tuned it out too quick. They turned it off. They should have stayed and listened to the praises and the shouts of God's people in this house. (laughs) Hallelujah. There shall be a song. Somebody asked you this afternoon or tomorrow, next week, what did Pastor Dave preach? You say, revival. A song in a hard time. And I've got to say this in closing. Listen very carefully, please. You're to sing in your present fire, in your adver- ad- adversity, in your hard time, financial, whatever it may You've got to get a song. You say, does God expect me to sing? I don't care what it is. There should be that little quiet. There's something very quiet and steadfast in the soul that sings, great is our God. See, he said they're going to sing about the majesty of God. Great is our God. Folks, I walk these streets and I sing. I sing in spite of, of... of crises, I sing in spite of all those things. There's something God puts in the heart. And you've got to get your song now. That'll be too late. Get it now. Get a hold of your song. There's a song in the night, but there's a song in the fire. Some of you are in a fire. The Bible says, build up your faith. The Apostle Paul said, put on the breastplate of hope, uh, uh, of faith and love and hope. Oh, praise God for the hope that is in our hearts. Now, we have a, a space here in the front of the church. We, we refer to it as the altar, another place to meet God. And I invite you, if you're here this morning, and God has spoken to you, you see, uh, God's not interested in you changing your life through fear, but through hope. And that's what this meeting is all about, hope. And you're here this morning and your hope has been staggered because you're going through a crisis in your life. And you say, well, Brother Dave, everybody's got some kind of a crisis. But I'm talking about a, a real serious thing that... that only God could give you a song. And there's been some, we call it the blues or depression. If you're standing here with the sound of my voice in the annex upstairs here, wherever we're at in this audience, and you need a touch, an absolute touch of God, you need the spirit of fear to be broken in you. So you can walk out of this building. Maybe that fear is because you're not walking with Christ as you did or should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you walked in here and you've never known what it is to have what people call a new birth. Or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I invite you to get out of your seat. Upstairs, wherever you are. And even in the annex, you can go to the lobby. And they'll show you how to get down here in the front of this church. And we will pray for you. You can come even while I'm talking. Just get out of your seat, up the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down. And we're going to believe God for a, a tremendous uh, change. Everything's a change in our. This can change for you in the next five minutes. There can be a change in your life. And the Lord can cleanse you, change your direction, and bring hope and life to your whole Your body, soul, mind, and the spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that you walk through this congregation, move through this congregation and find everyone that needs a miracle, a life-changing miracle, and those who would believe with us, would believe with us for that change in Jesus' name. And while they're singing, just get out of your seat, up in the balcony, come and join us here. We'll pray and we'll believe God for you and with you. If you don't know Christ, if you've drifted from Christ, follow these that are coming. Now, there are some, maybe many of you here this morning, 
worried and fretting. Pastor Dave, what do I, what do, I do in the future if some of these things you're talking about even begin to happen? What do we do? What about my house, my mortgage, all of these things? The Lord comes to us with a message that casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can, can you imagine a God who has flung into the cosmos, not just this one uh, world that we're living in, not this one galaxy, but you understand that there are millions and billions of galaxies beyond ours. The Hubble uh, telescope has discovered not just uh, billions of, they're talking about billions of universes. Can you imagine? Endless. And a God who can keep all of that in order. Can't he keep our lives in order? My goodness. And, and, and we have preached faith so long. We have toyed with faith. We have imagined we have faith. We have talked and preached and, and, and tried to test it and all. But, folks, that it, it is time. It is time. And the only reason I can think God would have me do this this morning is that you and I get a hold of some life-changing faith that no matter what happens, somehow God will deliver his people. It, and if, if, if we... If, Folks, how do you how do you explain the 16 Korean Presbyterians right now in the hands of the Afghan uh, terror, uh, Taliban? Two have been murdered, and then then we say, well, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den—they're all delivered, and God's not appointed us to wrath. Yes, but there's there, there are two, and they're dying one at a time. There are martyrs under the throne of God, multitudes of martyrs crying out that their blood be avenged, F- folks. We've got to be honest about it. We've got to be honest. I'm not going to play games with the church of Jesus Christ. You and I have, you and I have to be prepared to die for Jesus if necessary. And we will go through hard times. But if a God can, if a God can keep this world in orbit and there's a whole cosmos moving in their orbits and in their places and can you imagine a God who's named every billions of stars, every multiplied billions of stars, he's named them all. So he sure knows my name. He knows my name and he knows your name. God, help us to believe God and get a song in our trial. Father, in Jesus' name, we fight against doubt and unbelief and this cast down spirit. Lord, Help us to face the days ahead with Holy Ghost courage. And you are a strong tower. and We can run into you and be safe. We are safe in Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, give me confidence in the days ahead. And I trust in you. And help me, O oh Lord, to cast my cares upon you. Forgive my sins, Lord. Forgive my unbelief. Come by your Holy Spirit. Lift my spirit. Put joy in my heart. And a song in my heart. Of praise and glory to your holy name. Now let me pray again for the Father. Sweep over this congregation in the annex. The overflow rooms into the balcony and the choir loft and the pulpit and this whole house sweep over us with the gentle spirit of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just breathe upon us now as we walk out into the sunlight of this day. Let us realize, Lord, that this is not the sun that we're looking for. We thank you for it. But, oh, Lord, we, we go into a city where you are the sun. You are the brightness of the day. And, Lord... You will wipe away every tear, and you will strengthen us. Lord, we anticipate your coming. We anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord, from glory. Hallelujah. Will you now just thank him for his faithfulness to you? Lord, I thank you. 
This is the conclusion of the message.